Several years ago, I went to a funeral, and at the funeral, they had picked out a song. The family had picked out a song that's pretty common nowadays at a funeral called I Can Only Imagine. A lot of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the song, and the theme of it is someone, the person who's singing it is imagining what it will be like when he or she is in heaven, when he or she sees Jesus for the first time. One in the song says, uh, when, I, when I see Jesus... Uh, will, I, will I sing? Will I be able to speak at all? And one of the lines uh, asks the question, will I dance for Jesus or will I just in awe, in total awe, will I be, will I be still? And the, the pastor of the church decided, he made the decision that he was going to change the lyrics of the song for those who were and he eliminated the phrase about dancing. I don't remember what he changed it to, but he changed it to something else uh, because he had come to the conclusion that uh, there's no dancing in heaven because dancing is sinful and I guess we're going to be very serious and prim and proper in heaven or whatever. So, uh, you know, this was the conclusion that he came to and uh, that was that's what he did with it. Uh, and... You know, I guess I, I kind of understand that there are settings in which, you know, dancing is not appropriate or whatever. But I also, uh, I, I guess I'm thinking and imagining that when we are in heaven, uh, that we don't have this sinful nature anymore. And uh, we are no longer encumbered by worrying about the people around us and what they're going to think about us when we sing or when we move. And I'm pretty sure we'll probably have a lot of enthusiasm. Worship. I'm pretty confident there'll be some excitement in in our worship. Uh, I'm also pretty confident there'll be no uh, country line dancing in. God can't. There's that can't be that. No, I'm kidding. It's a joke. Uh, but there, there, there's tension over some of uh, those types of questions because people have different conclusions uh, about certain things in. And again, I understand the tension in the sense that there are of dancing that are not okay, right? There's form, and we're not going to get into them It's Sunday morning, right? We're not going to get into that. Uh, but there are forms of dance that are out of bounds, and there are certainly settings. As a follower of Jesus Christ, there's environments, there's places that if I want to have a good testimony, like I care about my testimony at all as a follower of Jesus, I shouldn't be in certain settings and certain environments. So, I mean, I, I get that. Uh, but it brings up some different questions when it comes to a subject matter like that. Like when I was, when I was in school... When I was in high school, I remember sitting down and having a conversation at the kitchen table with my parents, and the, dis and the discussion was over whether or not it was right or wrong for a Christian uh, to go to the prom. And maybe that's not a question you've ever even thought of. It's not even been on your radar, and you're like, that's kind of weird. But that was a legitimate conversation that my parents sat down at the kitchen table with me to have. And their argument, at least their they're trying to think through with you know the kind of music, testimony of, of being a follower of Jesus and maybe some of the sexual tensions there or whatever. They were trying to just think through that and, and make a good decision. And in fact, at that particular time, uh, there were a lot of churches that were wrestling with that, that question, uh, so much so that there were churches, a lot of them, that had offered uh, another event, like an alternative event to the prom, and a lot of students, a lot of youth groups had these types of events where uh, they would go out, you know, get dressed up, they'd go out to eat, and then they'd do some fun stuff afterwards or, or whatever. And it was just, it was a question that uh, believers, that Christians were trying to work through. And maybe that particular thing, uh, that's never come up in, in your family or whatever, but maybe there's other things. Maybe there is something else that's been a tension in your family, a tension among you and maybe... Uh, you, maybe your kids or you know, your parents were growing up and, and your parents had certain limits. They had certain boundaries that they had set for you and you just didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to you. Or maybe you just didn't even agree with their conclusions on, on those things. Um, maybe, maybe you were part of a church at some point in your life where uh, it just seems like they continue to add more and more things to the list of stuff that's wrong. And uh, you, you, you may be genuinely trying to understand the connection between this list of stuff that's wrong to do and the Bible. And maybe, maybe you struggled to see the connection between the two because it wasn't as clear as what 
And they seem so confidently uh, saying that it was. Maybe you personally grew up believing that something is wrong. Like your parents taught you that this or that is wrong to do. And, uh, and then as an adult, you find yourself, let's say, in a church setting where other Christians, people who love Jesus, have come to a different conclusion on that particular thing. You know, maybe the scripture's not as clear about it, or maybe there's just one of those gray areas. And, and, and you don't want to, but sometimes you might feel yourself struggling to not be condescending. Struggling not to look at someone as, well, they're a terrible Christian because they don't have the same spiritual conclusion that I do about this, uh, this particular matter, whatever, whatever it might be. So I have three baskets on, on the table with me this morning. And you know, the white basket represents those things that as believers, just, we know there's no debate. These things are always right to do, right? Uh, to love others, pray. You know, to read your Bible, to honor God. Uh, there's things that we can put in the white basket that we're not going to get pushback from each other. It's like, this is the right thing to do always for all of us. Right? There's things like that that Scripture teaches us. And there's certainly things that would fall into the, the, the black basket and that we know collectively from Scripture, there's certain things that are always wrong for all of us. Right? There's not a debate over it. Murder's not okay. There's not a debate to be had over adultery, it's not okay. It's going to go in the black basket. Uh, So there's certain things that we can collectively agree, always right, always wrong, because of what God taught us. And then there are questions that there are disagreements over. There are questions that we have that we find in the gray basket. And sometimes it's in the gray basket because there's not as much clarity in Scripture over a particular thing. Sometimes it's in the gray basket because, you know, there's different uh, conclusions that people have come, right? There's not uh, a specific verse that says, do this or don't do that. Uh, but there are principles, biblical principles, that, that we can apply to a particular can come to a conclusion that makes biblical sense, but we don't always come to that same conclusion. I'm going to give you a couple examples. I know that's kind of vague. Uh, but I'll give you a few examples. In our culture today, probably one of the biggest one among Christians is that of alcohol. What do we do with alcohol? Very clear on drunk, drunkenness, right? Don't get drunk. The Bible's very clear on that. It was in the black basket. That's not... But there are when it comes to how we handle alcohol among Christians, among Christians that love Jesus. And... And they're asking questions like, well, okay, but is it okay uh, to have a glass of wine with dinner? What do we do with having a beer at the ball game? What do we do with having a drink at the wedding reception? You'll have Christians who love Jesus that uh, will come to different conclusions on, on that, that issue. Uh, things like clothing is another one. Uh, we, we could say the Bible is very clear on modesty, right? Uh, immodest- Black basket issue, not a hard thing. The, the Bible is very clear on that. But who gets to pick what's modest and immodest? Who gets to make that? Who gets to make that decision? Right? You know, there's there's maybe some lines there that okay, you cross the line. Well, who gets to say you uh, say where the line is and I don't? Right? There's there's questions like that that sometimes come up with what is what is modesty. Certain kinds, certain kinds of music. You know, I joked about country music or, or whatever, but there's. You know, there, there's, certain, there's certain kinds of music that are just preference-based. You know, I, I, black basket stuff, I think we could put some things in the black basket uh, that, that has lyrics that, that we shouldn't be listening to. Or it's vulgar, and uh, maybe the subject matter just isn't appropriate. Right? There's, there's some stuff like that. Uh, but there's also stuff that's just music. Right? There's just some music stuff. Uh, it might not be your preference in, 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 in our call. Uh, it's typically set to the message, but you know they have like the loop of the same 20 songs, and sometimes uh, you want to listen to something different, and we might change the channel. And I don't, listen, I won't tell you who in my family this is. All right, I won't tell you who it is, uh, but his name starts with E, and it ends with Elijah. I won't tell you who, uh, but he he listened to the Elvis channel, and we're praying for him. We're 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 making that a matter of prayer uh, that God would from that, but. 
likes he likes the Elvis channel, and you know it's a preference. And a lot of those songs, you know, they're they're not right wrong. They're just kind of fun songs or whatever. Uh, so so my point is, you've got some people who say no, only Caleb, only the message, anything else is listening to it. And other people say, ah, there's songs that have held that are secular, and it's you know it, it's okay. You have different opinions about things like that. Uh, gambling is another another one that sometimes comes up where there's not a specific verse that you could go to that would prohibit that would prohibit gambling and yet there's lots of biblical principles that we could apply to that issue like greed right that's a that's a pretty fundamental biblical issue about greed there's verses that talk about don't be someone who's trying to get problems uh, the love of money which oftentimes uh, motivates someone so there are biblical principles that you could apply that would say it's probably not a wise thing to do, uh, and it could lead you in into sin. How, and you take that, and now you've got to make some decisions in the gray basket. What about lottery tickets, right? The lottery benefits older Pennsylvanians, and we love older Pennsylvanians, right? Right? Or is it okay? Uh, is it? Is it okay to buy a 50-50 ticket for that particular uh, thing that they're raising money for, right? There are, and there are people, if you're not one of them, just so you understand, people in this room, if you're kind of rolling your eyes like, what is the deal with it? I'm telling you, there are people in this room that say, no, that's not okay, that's gambling, that's off limits. And there are other people in the room, just they, they, don't, they don't see the issue. How, how about uh, entertainment? Uh, when it comes to uh, books and, and movies and, and games that have a focus on witchcraft or the occult. Now, we would say, as believers, the occult goes in our black basket, right? The Bible is pretty clear that if you're a follower of Jesus, witchcraft's not okay, right? We, we, we're not going to have pushback on that amongst each other. And, and yet, uh, there might be some questions that people are wondering when it comes to some of Entertainment choices uh, that, or you know, books, movies, that kind of stuff, games that uh, that center on, that are focused, or have characters that are into witchcraft. When I was, uh, the, my, I remember my mom uh, having this discussion with Michelle and I about the Smurfs. Remember the Smurfs? And she was kind of upset uh, about us watching the Smurfs. Now, if you don't know what the Smurfs are, they're, it's a cartoon character. These little, I don't know what they are. They're, they're Smurfs, and they're blue. And, and But the, one of the main characters, the bad guy in the Smurfs, was like this warlock witch kind of guy that was always doing spells and casting things, trying to kill the Smurfs. So, so she had to with that, and we had to talk about, you know, about the Smurfs. So there are people that uh, they look at those kind of questions, and they're like, yeah, it's not, it's not a big deal, because I'm not really doing those things. you got other Christians who say, no, you should stay as far away from that stuff as, as possible. How do we handle gray basket questions? I mean, we, we should have some type of strategy. that can, It shouldn't just be like, all you do what you want to do with the gray basket, and I'll do what I want to do with the gray basket. Right? There should be some, some way, some better way than that, Maybe you trust yourself. I don't trust myself uh, to be able to always come up with the best, uh, the best way to handle those things. I'd like to have something more. I'd like to have something that's more biblical-based than just whatever I think we should do with the, with the gray basket and whatever you think we should do with the gray basket. And I think we can have that because uh, the, the followers of Jesus Christ in, in Corinth, uh, they were wrestling with a gray basket question. And we're going to look at that this morning. If you would, would you open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We know that they had a number of disagreements over certain things in this church. Things that they were disagreeing over that they needed Paul's input on was found in verse 1 of chapter 8. It says this, Now regarding your question, so somehow they had gotten this question, Back to, to Paul, regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols. Well, what's, what's going on here? The food been offered to idols. Their question had to do with whether or not it was right or wrong for them to eat meat that had been sold in the market. Because nine times out of ten, that meat that had been sold in the market had already been offered to or sacrificed uh, as part of a pagan temple ceremony. 
And they're trying to, to, to figure out, is it right? Is it wrong? Should, should we not eat this meat because it, it, it was involved in this pagan temple worship stuff that's not okay? It's, you know, idol worship, idol worship, black basket stuff. We're not okay with that. But what do we do with the meat? Is it okay to eat that? And so that's what they're, that they're asking. And right off the bat, it's, it's a little challenging for us in 2020 to relate automatically to what they're asking. Because you know, when you go to the grocery store, uh, you, you go and get your chicken, your, your hamburger, your steak. You're not asking yourself, I wonder if the farmer who took it down to the Temple of Doom and did something weird with it. You're not asking yourself that question because that's not our experience in America. Now, there are places in the world where that is a very real question. There's places in Haiti where they do that kind of stuff. There's places in Africa, Thailand. There's stuff that goes on where they offer things to the spirit. Right? There's that, there are places in the world that this is very much a real question today. It was real to them in in the century. And he says this uh, in verse 1. He says, We know uh, we have knowledge, but while knowledge makes us feel important, it's that strengthens the church. Please don't miss that. You might come to a conclusion about something. Maybe you're right about it. And you've really thought through it. And you've really researched the scripture. And, and, and you, you got it nailed. Um, but love, he said, you know, that knowledge might make you feel important and it might uh, cause you to maybe want to look down on someone who hasn't taken the time to think through that as deeply as you. But love is what strengthens the church, not, not your knowledge. Anyone who claims to know all the answers does really know very much. But the person who loves God, the one whom God recognizes, man, that's, that's what matters. And he goes on to, to address some of these issues, which we'll look at in just a moment. Uh, but they were struggling with this. Everyone agreed, worship, okay, black basket uh, issue. But what they were struggling with, what if, you can read down through some of the questions that they were asking, what if my friend went over to his house? Friend's house? Be, uh, me over to his house for barbecue, and, you know, they're grilling up the burgers, and uh, nine times out of ten, I know where that burger came from. I know that that was involved in some kind of pagan worship. Is it okay for me to eat the burger? Should I bring all along my soy tofu thing in the cooler? Or, hey, you need to do this. I'm not eating your burger. Is it okay to do? How about if I go to the market myself? Uh, is it okay for me to buy the, the hamburger? Or do I need to be a vegetarian to be a good Christian? Right? This was the question that they wanted to know. And, and it went even beyond. If you read down through their, some of Paul's response, they, is it okay for me to go? to the temple gathering uh, rooms. So the, these pagan temples and pagan temples would have these fellowship halls and uh, people would use them for weddings, people would use them for uh, community gatherings and they were asking the question, uh, is, it, is it okay, uh, is it right or wrong for me to attend uh, this wedding or wedding reception? it is, you know, they're not worshiping idols at the time, but it's in, it's in the community building or this, this hall that's connected uh, to, to the people what to do about that. And the people on, on the side that are saying, it's fine, it's not a big deal, what their argument was, it's, it's okay because the idol's not real. It's a piece of wood, it's just metal. That, that's a false idol. It's not real. So when they sacrificed this whatever it is uh, in front of them, it happened. It wasn't a magical curse. God didn't change the meat into anything. It's just still meat. And the social gathering, they would say, was the same, the same thing. The idols aren't real, uh, so it's just a building. There's nothing magical about what the building because it's not real. And so they didn't have a problem with it. And then another group of people that said, no, 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 we, we need to carry our testimony more than that. and anything that we do that would associate in any way with idol worship, with, with some kind of demonic influence and some of that stuff, uh, it's saying that it's okay that it doesn't bother us if we participate even indirectly with what they're doing. We need to be separate from the culture that we live in. That was their argument. 
And as we sit here in, in 2020, and this is not part of our cultural experience, it's easy for us to listen to both arguments, to think through it logically, to think through it biblically, and to say, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. That makes sense. Okay, I, I understand your argument. Okay, that makes sense. And the reason we're able to do that is because we don't have a dog in the fight. We don't have a dog, because it's not our experience, and so there's not an emotional reaction to this issue. But what happens with us, if there is, if we do have a dog in the fight, if we do have a preference that's connected to what we want, it becomes a lot harder. It becomes a lot harder for us to detach ourselves from our preferences, to detach ourselves from our personal wants and desires, and look at a question and come to some conclusion that does honor God, that really is biblical, and, and uh, is not influenced by our preferences. It's a lot harder when we come to issues like that. Just understand that about yourself. Points of gray basket issues, it's really not always that easy. And we have to understand that about ourselves. One of the things I would like to do with the gray basket this morning, I'd like it to be more than just a container for questions of uncertainty. I'd like the gray basket to be more than just a container for the questions that we may have disagreements on. I would like to use the gray basket as a filter that we can take our questions of uncertainty or disagreement and filter them through some biblical points, biblical principles that Paul is going to give us, some wisdom that, God, that Paul's going to give us to help us work through those questions and come to some conclusions of right and wrong that aren't based on our preferences, that aren't based on our, our, our wants and desires, that are based on what does God say about this and the best we can possibly ascertain from His Word. So that's what I'd like to do with this this morning. And uh, Paul, just so you can see, if you haven't read it this week, uh, hopefully you read it this uh, coming week, chapters 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, he takes all of that time to answer that question. And that's a lot of ground that Paul covers. And we're not going to cover all of it. So if you didn't read it this week, uh, sometime this week to do that. I'm going to skip all the way to the end of chapter 10. Would you go there with 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. He, he starts out, Question, meat, food, offered to idols. So I'm going to answer it. And he starts to answer it. In chapter 9, he talks about his own personal experience where uh, he has freedom, he has rights, but he lays those things down for the sake of others. And then he comes back in chapter 10 with a con work there. 31 of chapter 10. Eat or drink or whatever you do. Whatever question that we're asking about in our gray basket, do it for the glory of God. If we could just start with the question, how is this, whatever it is, how is this going to bring glory to God? How is this going to honor God? If we could just start there, because what that does is it gets our mind off of ourselves and it repositions the question, it repositions our thinking towards what does God think about this? If I do this, say this, if I go here, do that or whatever, is it going to bring glory to God? Is it going to honor God in some way? He gives some examples uh, early on in chapter 10 where he, he challenges the believer, don't use your freedom to make sinful choices. You know, we have a lot of freedom in America. We can make all kinds of uh, choices and there's some to do. doesn't necessarily mean there's us to do. He talks in, in uh, he talks about idolatry. Now we would uh, we would understand that idolatry would be a black basket issue, it's worshiping idols, and and uh, in that particular setting, it had to do with a physical wood of idol, and that's not typically our experience. But there are other forms of idolatry that we struggle with in America today. I think materialism is probably one of the biggest of idolatry and struggle with in America. Because there's so much available to us and our, our standard of living is so high. We have a description in how we use our, our... very easy for us to only think about 
Christians and to forget biblical principles when it comes to money. You, know, you might say, well, I have the, I have the freedom to buy whatever I car, car I want. Don't tell me what kind of car to buy. Don't tell me what kind of house or how big a house or whatever. That's none of your business. Don't, don't tell me if it, that it's okay or not okay to go on a, a vacation. It's none of your business. I do whatever I want with my money. And, and that's true. You do have the freedom to, to do those things. Where we get into a problem is when we, we get into a materialistic approach to our money where we forget to be generous, where we set aside God's expectation that we're giving on a regular basis back a portion to us, where we where we begin to trust our money and put dependence on our money rather than in God, right? There, there are times fine with our freedom to use money in ways that, you know, however we want to use, use our money. And sexual immorality is one in verse 8. And uh, obviously there's some black basket uh, issues when it comes to sexual morality, right? Sex outside of mar marriage. You looked at that already. Uh, but there are people who have questions about that. How far is too far? And I don't know that it's just junior high and high school students question, right? I, I'm sure that there's others that are asking the question, okay, this is off limits, but how about this? Is this okay? How far is too far? Is it going to honor God? Is it going to draw... You know, and, and there's, there's ways to a answer that question where we first start with what would bring glory to God, what would honor God in this decision, rather than, eh, this is kind of really what I want to do with the, with the answer to that question. He also mentions uh, grumbling and complaining in verse 10. Yeah, he says, an example of uh, these grumblers and complainers, and that wasn't okay. And you say, whoa, whoa, the freedom open and honest with God? Don't I have the freedom to just uh, share with God my heart and my fears and my worries and my concerns my frustration? Yes, absolutely. We have to be careful that we don't take that freedom and, and turn it into something where, uh, where we're not satisfied with whatever God's provided for us. To have this attitude, God owes me something more than what He's provided. We don't want to use our freedom in that sense. We have to be careful that uh, when we talk about our freedom, that it brings honor and glory to God. Another one that we want to look at when we come to this filter is found in chapter 8. Go back to verse 9 of chapter 8. So we're thinking about God, thinking towards what would honor God, what would bring glory to Him, and the next... The next part of this filter has to do with other people. You must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you with your superior knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their own conscience by eating food that's been offered to an idol? So because of your superior knowledge, a weak believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed. And when you sin, encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. Paul says, okay, if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I'll never eat meat as long as I live. Why? Why would he sacrifice his own freedom? He doesn't have a problem eating the meat. Why would he sacrifice his own freedom? Well, he gives us the reason. I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. Chapter 10, verse 23, he comes back and makes a very similar conclusion. Chapter 10, verse 23 says, You say I'm allowed to do anything. All right, not everything's beneficial. You say I'm allowed to do anything. Not everything's good. Not everything's good. Not everything is beneficial. Just because you have the freedom to do it doesn't necessarily mean that you should. But then he ties this in, in verse 24. And I think this is, this is where a lot of us struggle when we make gray basket decisions. Verse 24, don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. I think that's where we 
the ball sometimes, where we're not concerned about how it's going to affect other people, just ourselves. I have the freedom to do it. Well, you may have a freedom to do it, and you may not even have a particular problem with that particular issue. But if someone who does, uh, and they see your behavior, and because of that, they don't, maybe they're weaker in their faith, maybe they're not, and, and they don't know how to stay within the boundary line. And you somehow affected their walk with Christ. I think it's important to see that Paul addresses those problem eating the questionable explain them why it's not wrong so it's not that Paul is making the point that those who are everything get to make all the rules that's not his point each other care about uh, one another when it comes to these kinds of questions so let's say you're your friend Festus, your uncle Festus, whatever. He has, he has a conclusion that alcohol is different from yours. And his conclusion is total absence. Stay away from it. Uh, don't, don't go anywhere near it, ever, for any reason. And that's his conclusion. He might have some really good reasons for that conclusion. It may be that he was in his past in some way, and Jesus delivered from, from that, and he knows how dangerous it can be, and he just wants nothing to do with it, and he doesn't want it, you, know, you to have any part of it because he cares about you, right? It could be that. It could be maybe his dad was an alcoholic and violent, and, and uh, he grew up with that and wants no part of it. could be that he was killed by a drunk driver, and that has affected him forever. There might be some really good reasons why Festus has that conclusion. If I love doesn't really matter that my conclusion might be different. If I love him, I'm going to have enough concern. I'm not going to have any part of that when I'm around him because I love him. You know, if we talk here about this verse, don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. I think that's something when we come to the gray basket that we often forget and often struggle with. What if, what if before we did anything, we started asking different questions? Is this going to honor God? How is this going to affect uh, other believers that maybe aren't as strong in their faith? One more. One more question to filter these questions through. If you go to chapter 9, again, look at verse 19. Chapter 9, verse 19, he says, Even though I am a free man with no matter, I have become a slave to all to bring many to Christ. Listen carefully to what he says here. He's saying, I have the freedom to do, do certain things. Totally within my right. Nothing wrong with doing certain things. He says, but in verse 20, when I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. That was his heart. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under the law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles who don't follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. I didn't ignore the law of God. I, I share their weakness. Why? For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Chapter 10, verse 32, he comes back to this. Don't give offense to the or the Gentiles or the church of God. I try to please everyone in everything I do. And he brings this up again. He says, I don't just do what is best for me. I do what's best for others. Why? So that they may be saved. Is that the question that you and I ask when we're trying to filter through and figure out what do we do with in this basket? Is it hurt my testimony with the gospel or is this going to help my testimony? Is this decision, how is it going to help share my faith in Jesus Christ? Or how is this going to hurt me? Is that how we filter out that question? Or is the way we filter out the gray basket questions go back here to this. What is best for me? There are two approaches, and they're very different. And I think if we're... There's a lot of times when it's all 
farther that we go with our gray basket questions. What's best for me? <laughs> they don't really give a rip. What's good for others? What's best for me? Today is the principle. Just a container for the things that we're about, the things that the is not as clear about, the things that maybe Christians have a conclusion on. Just a container to hold those questions. Let's think of it as a filter that we start at come to a good conclusion on what to do with that question. And I don't think that it's, that it's uh, an inadequate filter to say, what is best for Mark? I think there's got to be a better way to filter those questions. And I think Paul lays out some really good ways. Does it honor God? Is it going to bring glory to God? How is it going to affect other people? In, in example, this? is there some way that this is going to hurt my testimony? Uh, how is this going to help me share my faith with others? Or is it going to hurt me? Because when I think like that, when you think like that, the focus is no longer what's best for me. The focus is now on God and His glory and His honor and the focus is on other people. And if, 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 if we walk away from today just understanding that our focus shouldn't just be on ourselves in general in life, that our focus should be on on, on minds towards God and other people, man, we, we walk away with something that's going to make our lives better. You think about the gospel. The gospel is full of this. You know, Jesus Christ willingly died on the cross. He sacrificed himself. He didn't have to do that. He had the freedom to walk away. He had the freedom to say, I'm out and go back to heaven without going to the cross. But he didn't. He sacrificed himself for you and for me. Well, sacrificing our own freedoms, our own our own wants for the sake of others. He gave us an example of what it looks like first in ourselves. That's what it looks like to live out the gospel and to follow the example of Jesus Christ.